Time of worship this morning. You would take your Bibles with me and turn back to Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah chapter 53. So truly enjoyed studying uh, this particular chapter. I have, I have gleaned a great deal of information from it, and I'm thankful for it. And I pray the Lord would be pleased to bless uh, these humble uh, words to glorify and honor and exalt him whom we've been talking about for the previous four messages now, the arm of the Lord. Uh, and that's the name of this message. This will be the arm of the Lord, part four. The arm of the Lord, part four. You know, <clears throat> as, as I looked at these verses this week, and I thought we were going to cover verses five and six today, and as I thought about what they present to our mind, and we'll, we'll get to them in just a minute, one of the things that, became a present reality to me is this. The Lord God, Jehovah, in his providence has given you and me undeniable evidence of his absolute hatred of sin. (laughs) God hates all sin. He does. And see, think about it. I know God hates sin because it was because of man's sin at the beginning that God destroyed the world that existed with a flood. Listen to this. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth. And that, listen, that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Let that sink in. Because I don't know if you know it. This is, I'm reading to you Genesis chapter 6. This is verse 5 and 7. You know what verse 8 says? We're not going to read it, but you know what it says? But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. So when we're talking about that the wickedness of man was great and that every imagination of his thought was only evil continually, who's included in this? Even Noah. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping things and the fowls of the air. For it repenteth me that I have made them. That's Genesis chapter 6, verse 5 through 7. And what did God do? He broke open the depths and brought rain from the skies and covered this earth with a flood for a full year, saving only eight souls. And everybody outside of that ark perished in unbelief. It wasn't that there was some saved people out there that died. People say, it's not that God chooses others and doesn't choose all. He picked eight and destroyed the rest. Now, our, our God's in the heavens. He might not be your God. Our God is in the heaven. And whatsoever he pleased, that did he in heaven and in earth all the deep places. This is a God we deal with. He, he ain't worried about your feelings or mine or what we think about things. You think about this. Because of sin, God has afflicted individuals. He's afflicted families. Folks, he's afflicted nations proclaiming by his judgment on them his absolute hatred of sin. One of them I think of in particular, Sodom and Gomorrah. Huh? Obliterated. So much so that it couldn't even be found. But here's the thing. Yet those he reveals his hatred of sin to, and I see this even at the end of time, the one that he reveals his hatred of sin to, for the most part, you know what? They don't acknowledge him or his power or his authority, or his judgment. 
This same prophet Isaiah declared, Lord, when thy hand is lifted up, lifted up how? In judgment. They shall not see. They shall not see. They don't understand. Here's the, here's the thought of the natural man. Why me? They don't think they deserve it. You and I, by nature, what do we think? We don't think we deserve it. But the next words out of Isaiah's mouth, you think this, he said, Lord, when thy hands lifted up, they shall not see. But he says this, they shall see and be ashamed. Individuals, families, and nations on whom the consequences of sin have fallen throughout history, instead of turning from their ways, their sinfulness. What do they do? They turn around and they curse the king. They curse their God. Never willing to acknowledge and never able to acknowledge that it's because of their sin. Here's the thing. As children of God, I was taught by His Holy Spirit, we understand all too well, painfully, and with great ashamedness, the evil of sin. Do we not? As it's revealed to us by His Word. You think about it. God's law accuses us in our consciences, even now. And by God's grace, you know what we do? We say, we don't deserve it. Isn't that what we do? No, we justify God in it. Realize and we confess as he deals with us by his Holy Spirit and his word, the infinite persistence and evil that remains in us. Listen to King David. Against thee, thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight. This is the part of this verse that just gets me. That thou mightest be justified when thou speakest in judgment against my sin and be clear when thou judgest. But now this is what I want us to see this morning. If the Lord would give us some liberty and give us eyes to see, heart, mind, and will to comprehend, I hope he'll reveal to us in these passages I want to look at this morning that there's one place, and I want to stress this this morning, there is one place and there's one person where and in whom sin and its us most evil and punishment, where God's absolute hatred of sin met. And listen, it wasn't at Adam's fall. It wasn't at the flood. It wasn't when he destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. It was not when he swallowed Korah up into the ground alive with those 25,000 or so people that he destroyed. And folk, it was not at, during the Holocaust that God's wrath met. It was God's hatred and his eternal wrath met in that person, the arm of the Lord and him crucified. See, here's the thing. You can only see God's eternal wrath against sin as he dealt with his son. And he dealt with him not because of sins he had committed, but he dealt with him how? They met on him as our surety, our substance. Now, keeping that in mind, let's look at our verses for this morning. He says what he was wounded for our transgressions. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, thank God for this, with his stripes, we are healed. The original word translated by the phrase, he was wounded, it means to pierce. Or to be wounded fatally. Or how about this one? To be bored through. And when I think about being bored through, I, I, every time I see that word or that expression, I always think about the uh, bond slave. Remember, he, he's been there with his family, been in prison, 
you know, been a captive, uh, been a slave all his life. Year of Jubilee comes after 50 years, and he's about to go free. And if he goes out, leaves his master behind, if he's got a wife and children and everything he's has that he's gained while he's there, where does he have to stay? Has to stay. He can go out, but his family, everything is his, stays behind. But if he will go to his master and say, I love my master, I love my wife, I love my family, I love my, every, my life, everything I've got, and his master carries him down to the priest and they take his ear and they take an awl, not an awl, but an awl, and they bore his ear through to the post of the tabernacle. He is a, showing himself to be a bond slave to God, a willing servant to God for how long? Forever. Who's that a picture of? David said of this same word, it said that it means to open one's ear is what it means. And he says that he opened Christ's ear. Christ became our bond slave. For his love for us. Uh-huh. He willingly gave himself in our place. That word translated... But he was wounded means to be pierced fatally or to be born through. That original word translated for our transgression is one word in the original which means guilt of transgression, punishment of transgression, or even better, an offering for transgressions. The Holy Spirit by the prophet Isaiah, he states dogmatically for us here by these words, that the arm of the Lord, now get this in your mind, the arm of the Lord was pierced, he was bored through, he was fatally wounded. He didn't swoon, he was fatally wounded. This person actually died for what? Our transgressions. The punishment of our transgressions. He died as an offering for our transgressions. That's why I read Romans chapter 5 to you. See, what all these verses are setting before us is a truth that's rejected and unknown by the natural mind. Namely, that Messiah is what? He is his people's surety. People don't know what a surety is. They just don't. They don't think it's important. It's an essential truth of the gospel. Matter of fact, you think about it, you know in the New Testament, in the entirety of the New Testament, the word surety is used one time. Just one time in the entirety of the New Testament. It's used over in Hebrews. And it speaks exclusively of just one person. Listen to this. By so much was Jesus made a surety of a better testament. He goes on that same chapter, talks about it's made on better promises, and a better offering. That word translated surety, you know what it means? It means sponsor, or one who becomes responsible for another. The word actually, when you think about the word surety, it, it's closely related to the word, the English word we use, near, N-E-A-R. And it's the equivalent of mediator. There's one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. And what does a mediator mean? A mediator means one who draws near. I always think about it. I think it was in the book of Job. Can't tell you the verse. I can look it up for you afterward. But he says, let deliver him from going down to the pit. For I have found ransom. What somebody to stand in my place. Why do we need a mediator? Why is it essential that you and I have a surety? Is it? Look back up at verse 2 and 3 of our text. For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, as a root out of dry ground. He hath no form or comeliness. And when we shall see him, there's no beauty that we should desire him. He's despised, rejected of men, man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. 
We hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Our text teaches us that when Christ was fatally wounded or pierced, not for his own sins, not for any sins of his own, for our sins. And when you think about it, the cross or the Christ of the cross are offensive to the natural mind. That's what verse 2 and 3 tell us. We didn't want it. We weren't looking for it. We had no desire for it. We wanted salvation our way after our own thought processes. And when you think about it, the natural mind cannot and it does not see what is necessary in order to, for salvation to be accomplished. In our unregenerate state, you know what? We think we did something to get ourselves into this mess, just like Adam. And since we did something to get ourselves into that state, what do we think? We think we can do something to get ourselves out of it. Nothing could be further from the truth. But you can't unwind this thing nor can you unwind yourself from it. But here's the thing. Thank God for this. So the cross, the offensive nature of the cross for the child of God, it's removed in our minds. How? When God, by His grace, causes us to see and know and understand that by the death of our surety, the Lord Jesus Christ, our sins are expiated, are put away, and our salvation has been obtained. It's not something that might have or hope to have. It's ours. But notice what he says next. He was bruised for our iniquities. That word translated, he, actually, he was is in italics. It's just one word, bruised. In the original, it means crushed. He was crushed or to be crushed, or this is the best translation of it, and especially as we apply it to the arm of the Lord in our surety, to allow oneself to be crushed. Listen, he, this person was equal with God. This person was God. Thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Made himself of no reputation and took upon himself the form of a servant became obedient unto death. What kind of death? The cursed death. Why? He was made a curse for us and he was made sin for us. Right? Because it was required. John Gill wrote in his commentary on the meaning of these words, he said, is bread, corn, is bruised by threshing it or by its being grilled in the meal as manna was. Or his spice is bruised in a mortar. Christ was broken and crushed to pieces under the weight of sin and the punishment of it. Get that image in your mind. I, I, I've been reading. It's, it's weird. You know, I read like four or five devotionals each week. And, you know, Easter moves around so much that, you know, Easter moved all the way into March this, this time. And so last week, as I was reading these devotionals and posting them to social media, nothing was about Easter. Well, now this week, it's more timely fashion where he said, everything's about, about Easter this time. And like I told you last week, Easter for us, that's a man-made word, but the story of the resurrection, the death of Christ, it's timeless. It's an everyday event, Right? And one of the ones that just, just gets me more than anything else is the way our Lord Jesus Christ bore the entirety of the curse. And part of the curse was what? You earn your keep by the sweat of your brow. And then I see my blessed Lord in a garden crossed over that old filthy... I don't know, what is the name of that thing? They went through the, the river of... Uh, I don't forgot the name of it. What's that river called? The kid, Brook Kidra which is, Brook Kidburn was where all of the filth and the leftover from the, from the sacrifices poured out and went down into the Brook Kidburn. Bloody, filthy. He, our blessed Lord crossed that Brook Kidburn to get into the garden. And then he leaves his apostles and he goes a little further. And bearing the weight of our sin, he's crushed under it as he's there. And he begins to do what? Sweat as it were. 
drops of blood, big enough that they were dropping off of him. Why? He was bearing our sin, right? He bore our curse in its entirety. Again, not for any sins of his own, but crushed under the weight of all the sins of all the elect of all the ages, imputed, and I know people have trouble with this, and they say that imputation doesn't, it never applied to Christ. Oh, yes, it did. Our sins were imputed to Christ. They were legally accounted His because they, the reason they make that kind of stupid statement, they don't understand what a surety is. What one who takes upon himself the responsibility of another is our surety. What did he do? It was all legally charged to him. Became his. He made him to be sin for us. No trickery. No changing of the language. No looking into the minutiae of the words. Just he made him to be sin for us. Who knew no sin that we might be made to righteousness of God in him. But Isaiah doesn't stop. Next, what does he say? The chastisement of our peace was upon him. What a blessed truth. This speaks to the sinner, the heart of the sinner that's laboring and heavy laden with sin. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. That word translated to chastisement means discipline or chastening or correction. And that word translated of our peace in the English is one word. You know what it is? It's shalom. Thou wilt keep him in shalom, shalom, perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on him because he trusts in him. It means completeness, soundness, peace. These words teach us that the punishment due to all our sins, what did it do? It fell on him. Everything that was required for God to make peace with himself, where did it fall? Our surety, the Lord Jesus Christ, reconciling us to him and establishing peace with God for us. We preached on this not too long ago. And all things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation to wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them. We read it in Romans chapter 5, verse 1, just a moment ago. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have what? Peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, a lot of people get hung up in this word chastisement, and they think it's talking about something that it's not. This isn't talking about, when he talks about chastening here, it's not, gonna, not talking about the chastening of a child by the father out of love, but you know what this word chastening here speaks of? It speaks of an act of vindictive judgment and wrath against sin. Our sin. Where? In the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. See, by his work, by the Lord Jesus Christ, work is our surety. Divine wrath is appeased. Justice is satisfied. And peace was made. Listen to this. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were sometime far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace. Who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition. Between us, having abolished the enmity in flesh, even the law of commandments and ordinances, for to make peace, make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace. Who made peace? Christ did. Remember in Isaiah chapter 9, when it was talking about the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ, it said his name should be called Wonderful Counselor, the Everlasting God. Or the mighty father, the everlasting God, the prince of peace. Those angels at his birth, what did they declare? Peace on earth. Not world peace. Peace with God. Wherever was peace with God. And that person at that star stood over. See? That's where our peace is at. Our chastisement fell on Christ our peace. But he continues. They declare the accomplishment of surety. And next word, and with his stripes, we're healed. 
With his stripes we're healed. One of the things that really got me as I was studying this this week, there's no mention of us. <laughs> there's no mention of our faith or our repentance, our reformation, or even our perseverance. By his stripes, we are healed. All of it rested on who? The arm of the Lord. That phrase, and with his stripes, is one word in the original. And it means to bruise or to strike or to blow. Here's the same word Moses used it. <clears throat> Exodus 21. said, and if any mischief follow, then thou shalt give life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, Foot for foot, burning for burning, wound for wound. Here's the same word, stripe for stripe. In other words, the stripe that's supposed to fall on me, it's got to go somewhere. It had to fall somewhere. I love the way Mr. Gill wrote on this part of the verse. He said, sin is a disease belonging to all men a natural, hereditary, nauseous, and incurable one. But by the blood of Christ, forgiving sin is a healing of this disease. And this is to be had and in no other way than through the stripes and wounds and the blood and sacrifice of the Son of God. Truly, our Lord Jesus Christ is a wonderful physician he heals by taking the sicknesses of his people upon himself, by bearing their sins, being wounded and bruised for them, and by his enduring blows and suffering death itself for them. The Targum, which is the Old Testament law, states, when we obey his words, our sins will be forgiven. But forgiveness is not through your obedience but through the blood of Christ, period. You know what all this is talking about? It's talking about spiritual healing in, through, and by the Lord Jesus Christ. I always think about when our Lord Jesus Christ, as was his custom, went down to Nazareth to read the scriptures. And he went in. I oh, know this is that, that, that's another verse. Ah, forget about it. That's Luke chapter 4. I was going to read that. We're not going to read that. Write, write that verse down, Luke 4, 16 through 20, 21. He said he was sent to heal the sick. Not physically. He did heal the sick, physically sick. But he healed who? Spiritual healing is what we're talking about. But he bore our stripes in his body. And he was down there in the Pharisees. Listen to what it says. It says, when the scribes and Pharisees saw him eat with publicans and sinners... They said unto him, How is it? He said to his disciples, How is it that he eateth and drinketh with publicans and sinners? When Jesus heard it, he saith unto them, They that are whole have no need of a physician, but they that are sick. So somebody needs a physician. Who does? It's the sick. Were these people he's talking about, did, were, they, were they not sick? Oh, yeah, they were sick. But they didn't know they were sick. Those that are truly sick, they know it. By God's grace. I came not to call the righteous. That's the ones he's talking about that don't need the physician. Those that think they're righteous. But to call, here we go, sinners. Sinners to repent. Look at verse 6. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. <laughs> Here's Young's little translation of this verse. All of us like sheep have wandered. Each to his own way we have turned. <laughs> That's so us, isn't it? And here's the thing. When he talks about all we like sheep have gone astray, who's included in this? All God's elect. Both Jew and Gentile from every kindred, nation, tongue, and people. 
But the fact that he compares us to sheep, folks, it's not a commendation. It's not a commendable thing. He doesn't, he doesn't talk about the, when he's calling and referring to his church as sheep, it's not a redeeming quality. He refers to us as sheep because you know what sheep are? Huh? They're foolish and they're stupid. <laughs> you think about it. By nature, sheep, what are they? They wander. They wander away from the fold. They wander away from the shepherd. They wander away from the food. They wander away from the goodness and safety of the pasture. But here's another thing. When sheep do wander, do they ever come back? You know, they say you can drop a dog. I don't know about this. They say you can drop a dog off anywhere and what can he do? He find his way back home. A sheep get lost? Kenny's gone. He'll wander into the mouth of some predators. What he'll do? He won't. I think I'll go home now. He won't do that. It's impossible. They'll never return home. What has to happen? Somebody has to seek them. And not only do they have to be sought, they have to be found. And not only do they have to be found, what do they have to be? They have to be brought back. Peter, Peter knew this. Who they brought back by? The parable of the 99 and the 100 sheep. The one he leaves the 99 behind. He goes, finds, and seeks diligently until he finds that one sheep, and when he finds him, what does he do? Puts a rope around his neck, leads him back home. No, 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 no. What's he do? He places it on his shoulders, and he carries it home. Right? Peter knew this all too well. He said this, For we were as sheep going astray, but now we are returned unto the shepherd and bishop of our souls. Think about that. A shepherd over our souls. Paul stated it this way. There's none that understandeth. There's none that seeketh after God. They're all going out of the way. Isn't that what he said? All we like sheep have gone astray. We're all going our own way. We're all going out of the way. They're all together become unprofitable. There's none that doeth good. No, not one. But those that are born of God, they should and they do. What do we give thanks for? The great shepherd of the sheep. The Lord Jesus Christ. Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ. Here's what he is to us. That great shepherd of the sheep. Through the blood of the everlasting covenant. Might make you perfect in every good work to do his will. Working in you that which is well pleasing in his sight. Through Jesus Christ to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. But look at this last thing and we'll quit. Look at the last part of verse 6. And the Lord... It's an Old Testament declaration, 2 Corinthians 5, 21. I love the little translation of these words. And Jehovah hath cause to meet on him the punishment of us all. Where did it meet? What, how did we start this off? Where, does God's, where can you see God's wrath? Where did it meet? You want to see how, how, how much God hates sin? When it was found charged... To his holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinner's son. That holy thing. What did he do? He crushed him to death. He made his soul an offering for sin. What does this tell us? God the Father, who we all sinned against, from whom all we turn, and whose justice has to be satisfied, he laid on Christ, his own son, all the sins of all the elect. Laid them on him. They were laid on him. And here's the thing. Christ bore them willingly. He bore all the entirety of the punishment due unto those sins. I don't know about you. I can't begin to even imagine the weight of that load. Can you? But I do know this. It was a burden that only one who was God could bear. And when I wrote that into my notes, and I think about that statement, the only, the load was so heavy that only God could bear it. It always brings a verse to one of those hymns. I wanted to sing it today, but ain't no way we're singing that one without a piano. 
Thy work's not mine, O Christ. I'm think, so thankful that that song came into the one stanza always rings in my mind. Thy cross, not mine, O Christ, has borne the awful load of sins that none in heaven or earth could bear but God. That's what it required. Huh. I believe these words refer back to that Old Testament type that shows us exactly what happened in this transaction between God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. It was typified in that scapegoat to where that priest laid his hands on one of the priests. You know, they, he prayed over the one that they sacrificed, and then he laid his hands on the scapegoat, prayed all the sins of all the people and all the transgressions of their sin upon the head of that goat, that goat didn't change. He didn't turn into a werewolf, and become evil and vile. He didn't, it, it wasn't dripping off. It was laid on him. He was a sin offering, right? And then it says you're to take him with a, a new rope, put it around his neck, and by the hand of a fit man, he's to lead him out into the wilderness and let him go. Who's the fit man? Huh? It's the Lord Jesus Christ. And he bore them away perfectly and completely and forever. As our surety, our scapegoat, as they were laid on him. Listen to Jeremiah. In those days and in that time, saith the Lord, the iniquity of Israel shall be sought for. And there be none. And the sins of Judah, they shall not be found. For I will pardon them whom I reserve. There's pardon in Christ. Micah wrote it like this. He will turn again. He will have compassion on us. He will subdue our iniquities. And thou wilt cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. And it's not in my notes, but it came into my mind. Deepest place on the planet is what? Challenger Deep. You throw Mount Everest into where Challenger Deep's at and you'd have 9,000 feet left above Mount Everest. And that dip there means the deepest part, the darkest part. He cast our sins into the depth of the sea. And like Henry used to say, he puts up a sign that says, no fishing. Quit, quit reaching back over there, pulling all those things up. That brings up this question, we'll quit. How can a holy God, who was by no means clear the guilty, do this? How can he do this? Does he pretend that we're something that we're not? The sins and iniquity of all those Christ represented as their surety and substitute can't be found. Why? Because Christ satisfied God totally and completely as our surety and substitute. And he did that work how? Is the arm of the Lord. For by one offering, he, this arm of the Lord, he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. And we'll come back next time and we'll pick up in verse 7. Folks, we serve such a merciful God, do we not? And we ought to praise him and thank him for his infinite mercy and grace to us. Let's stand together and we'll be dismissed. Lord bless you. Keep you till we see you next Lord's Day. But if you would dismiss us, please.